and we gave you this introduction about the kingdom of God and we, you know, walk through all the things that God has done from the beginning and how he placed this kingdom dominion in us and then how he positioned us and then how he set Jesus up for success, bringing forth the kingdom of God. And when we think about the kingdom of God, nine times out of ten, we usually think about something that's outside of us. But we also talked about last week that where Jesus was praying, he said, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. So we recognize this kingdom and that what God is looking to establish is something that's not external. It's not outside of us. It's not something that we wait for when we die. It's something that we can receive right here, right now. That there is power and there's authority and there's victory and there's favor and there's blessings and there's all types of ma massive value in the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God can be described like a government. We talked about governments. We talked about our government where we have a democracy, which means that the people rule. The people are the ones that dictate what happens and what doesn't happen. Now, we don't do that directly, but we do it indirectly through the votes that we put in for people to get into office. And then those people in office vote for different bills or different laws or rules or regulations that are put in place. We have a president that's able to veto some things, but we also have a president that can't just make things things happen on his own and by himself without a group of other people agreeing with what he wants to do. So there's limits to the power that he has. But in a kingdom, that's not how it operates. That's not how it works. A kingdom has a king. The king in a kingdom is a sovereign, which means he's got no authority that is over him in any capacity. He can say whatever he wants to say, do whatever he want to do, whenever he want to do it. Even in your Bible, if you look in your Old Testament, you'll see multiple times where when the king spoke, when he spoke, it became law. Why? Because when the king speaks, it it happens. It comes. That's why when God speaks and he said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And he said, let there be light. And then what had to happen? Light had to take place. Light might not even know what it what what, what it even was. But when God spoke it, whatever it was had to come into existence and position itself effectively in order for it to do what God says do. Because when the king speaks, it's got to happen. That's why also the word of God says my word, God says my word will not return to him void. Which means the word, once it goes out of his mouth, it must come back and complete whatever it is that he's called it to complete. We also know that we serve a God where it says, no man, uh, God is not a man that he shall lie, nor is he the son of man that he shall repent. Which means when God speak it, not only is it truth, but when God speak it, it also must be so. That's what we know about God and how he's established and set up the kingdom of God. Jesus now comes onto the scene, and when Jesus comes on the scene, uh, he goes through all of his lifetime, you know, the early years of life, and he was learning how to be a carpenter, use his hands, do all those things. But when it was time for Jesus to go to work, see, Jesus had a job, but Jesus didn't quite go to work yet. When it was time for him to do his work, God took him to the uh, the river, and John the Baptist, you know, baptized him. The Bible says the, the, uh, the sky opened up, and like a dove falling down on Jesus, he was now anointed. He goes the spirit leads him into the spirit leads him into the desert now catch that the spirit led Jesus into the desert I mean God will lead you to some places that you don't want to go but Jesus gets led into the desert he comes out of the desert and in Matthew chapter number four verse number 17 he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand it's kind of like this proclamation like I'm ready to get to work <laughs> I'm, re I'm ready to do this and then the Bible talks to us and he says he went all about preaching and teaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so we continue to build on that on this morning and we go from where we were on last week to now we're getting to the keys of the kingdom. Now, this is important, the keys of the kingdom, because when you have keys, keys unlock something. Right. You see the key on the picture that we have right here. It's a key. The key is meant to do something intentional, to unlock something. But I'm going to tell you about a different type of key other than the key that unlocks something. I'm going to tell you about something where God had really manifested himself and talked to us about this kingdom and how he wanted us to utilize this key that he gives us. Because he really doesn't give us he, he, he gives us these these keys, but I think we're going to use them a little differently then you would normally use a key. So if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter number 16 is where we're going to sit a lot of time today. The book of Matthew, chapter number 16. And we're going to start at verse number 13. We're going to read from, from verse 13 through verse 20. 
And then after we read the word of God, we will pray. And then after we pray, we'll get right into the word. Is that all right? Amen. So if we could stand for the reading of his word. Amen. We're going to read Matthew chapter number 16, verse 13 through 20. And after we read, we'll pray. And after we pray, we'll go right into the word. So the Bible says this, Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say the son of man am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he says to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Barjona, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. In verse number 19, he says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Come on, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we pray for the word of God on today. We pray, Lord, that you open up our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receive the word that you have for us, that it will be a blessing unto the ears of the ones who hear it. And Lord, that it will shift and change and push us into the direction that you need for us to go to, to satisfy and fulfill your purpose. And God, we pray that you get all the honor, you get all the glory and all the praise. And this we thank you in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So this morning we're talking about the keys of the kingdom. Now it's very important that we understand this whole purpose of the birth of Jesus Christ. We recognize that Jesus was born. God had a plan for us. He had a plan from the very beginning. He already understood. He said, listen, Adam and Eve, y'all done messed up. Y'all done you, you messed it all up. I had an awesome plan in place. You messed up the plan. But God was thinking, I already knew you was going to mess the plan up. So I already had a backup plan. Y'all know how it is to have a backup plan. Like, I usually have backup plans. Like, I have a plan, but then I have a backup plan. Just in case the plan don't work, I'm already thinking a couple of steps ahead. It's kind of like when you're playing chess with somebody. Now, I'm not a great chess player, but the ones that are really good, they can think like four and five and six moves ahead. I'm just trying to figure out what, what does this one actually do? <laughs> I mean, they're thinking about five and six moves. I'm just thinking, does this one go diagonal? Does this one go straight up and down? One goes up two and over one. You know, I'm just trying to figure out which one does what. So I'm not that advanced, but God is always thinking way ahead of us because God has already been in the end. Now think about that. God has been in the end, and therefore everything that he created from the beginning is to establish the picture of what he knows to be the end. That's just, it'll hurt your head if you think about it for too long. But Jesus comes back to influence the world to attach itself to the kingdom of God. His whole purpose is to come back and influence the world to attach themselves to the kingdom of God. We are his children that he loves. And so now he desires for us to live this life, not based on our own ability, but based on his ability. And so Jesus or God is thinking, I could imagine God thinking from the heavenly places. Now, how now he's not really thinking this because he already knows the answer. But just for the for the uh, for the sake of our sermon this morning, he's thinking to talking to himself. How do I get my power and ability so that the people can live the type of life that I desire for them to live in them? It's kind of like, how do I raise my children in a way when they lead a house, they act right? You know what I'm saying? That's, like, that's what God's thinking. How do I get my power and my authority and my ability in them so that when they leave the house, when they're on earth, they can actually live the way that I've called them to live? Because it's crazy that we are king's kids. We are a royal priesthood, but we don't live like it here. Can you imagine that? Could you imagine a real king right now? Say King Charles over in England, right? He got children. Could you imagine if his children were living in poverty? And he gave them access to all that they have. 
How would that make him feel? How would you feel? You would feel like, what, what is going on? What did I do wrong? So God comes up with this plan to establish Jesus, to bring Jesus back in order to influence us, to attach ourselves to the kingdom of God so we can live in the power and authority by which God gave to us. Now, influence is the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone. God wanted to impact our character, our character. Now, look what did it say about character again? It says your character, your development, your behavior, the way you do what you do. God didn't just want to give you something, new car, new house, money in the bank. He wanted to influence your behavior. That's what he wanted to influence. That's what he wanted to position in your life. Jesus was a teacher whose life was an example of the manifested power and authority that God has given by the kingdom of God. So when Jesus is walking on the earth, he's doing all these miraculous things. And so everybody is enamored by Jesus because at that time, he's the only one walking with the power of God in him. So therefore, he's got all the essence of the spirit of God, giving him the authority from the kingdom of God to do whatever it is that God called him to do. So when God says, heal the blind man, he heals the blind man. When God says, heal the lame, he heals the lame. When God says, storm, you got to cease. The storm has got to cease because he's not coming from his own authority and his own power. He's speaking from his heavenly authority and his heavenly power. See, Herod had authority and Pharaoh had authority, but they don't have the type of authority that God God has. God is the creator, so therefore he's got all control over everything that he created and everything that belongs to him. The Bible even tells us that the earth is the Lord's, the earth is the Lord's, and everything that dwells therein. So he came from a spiritual, heavenly authority, which gave him the capability of doing the things that everyone saw that was miraculous. And as he taught the disciples, his expectation was, his expectation was, his expectation was that they would do what he did. And when they didn't do it, he would say, oh, ye of little faith, because they weren't connected as tightly as they needed to be to the kingdom of God to do the things of God. Wow. And so Jesus came for this purpose. Now, I got to use this scripture because if I don't, someone's going to say that I didn't use it. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, <laughs> you should know this by heart. Don't put the scripture up. Don't even put it up on the screen. You should know this. Then God said, let us Make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion. I can't preach on that enough because this is what it's all about. Your dominion is not in the pastor. That's not where you get your power from. That's not where you get your authority from. That's not where you get the essence of what it is that God's called you to do. It comes from God. Now, the pastor can help, you know, you know, you know, when the fire is going, you know, the pastor can get that thing going a little bit bigger and say, OK, OK, you got it going. You got it going. Come on, stay connected, stay connected, stay connected, stay connected, stay connected. But your connection to Christ is what gives you this, what God says that is yours. The dominion, the power and authority, it can't be given from me. I can lay hands on you all day and you walk out of here and act crazy. You can stay in here on your face. We can put all the oil we want. We can have all the pools baptized 10 times. It don't matter. If you don't make a decision to shift and change, then you'll never receive that which is yours. Just like the disciples that was with Jesus, with him. They was with him. Like they was like, there with him and they still couldn't get it when people would come and they couldn't heal him and then Jesus would say oh you a little faith you've been with me this long but yet you still you still don't believe like where where are we right now like what else do I need to do for you right and so now we see that Jesus came so that we can have this power but most don't walk in the dominion and the power of God and we don't walk in the dominion and power of God we usually blame everything around us for why we don't do that we blame everyone. It's because of the way that I was raised. It's because of what they told me. It's because of what the bank won't give me this or the job won't do this or my parents did this or my brother did this or my friend did this. And so we got all these reasons on why we can't do that, which God has called us to do. 
And if you have a reason on why you can't do what God has called you to do, then you've made that reason bigger than God. Whew. Because God has all power and all authority. So if you have something that's preventing you from getting to where you want to go and you see that obstacle bigger than you getting there, then now you're not just doubting you, you're doubting God. We're doubting God. So let's talk about this thing and why most people don't walk in the dominion that God provided. Let's let's talk about three things. I got three things on why most people don't walk in the dominion that God has given us. Okay, first one, sin. Sin is the classic one. I mean, that's what got Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden. They had this power. They had this authority. They were able to do everything. God said, listen, I'm going to let you do anything you want to do because you're in my presence already. So you're not going to do nothing crazy. He says, there's one thing that I'm calling you not to do. Think about it. You have one job not to eat from the one tree. Are you kidding me? And they still couldn't do that. And so that sin was rebellion against God's word. He said, what? You want to you think that you're going to know more than me because you eat from this tree? Are you crazy? And so now we got ourselves into a situation where sin prevents us from walking in the fullness of who God's called us to be. That's why God calls to do the things that we do, because he made us in his image and according to his likeness. That means I'm made to look like him and have the character of him. And if I don't look and have the character of him, then I can't get the back half of Genesis 126, which is the dominion. See, we want the dominion without being in the image and without being in the character of God. So we're like, God, give me the stuff, even though I'm acting crazy. Give me the stuff, even though I'm doing the things I want to do and not the things that you will have called for me to do. But God says, no, I'm not giving you the stuff unless you're in my image and according to my likeness. In James chapter number four, verse number 17, James chapter number four, verse number 17, the Bible said this. He says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, him it is sin. Now, sin is more than just murder. Sin is more than just stealing. Sin is more than just adultery. Sin is more than just all those types of things. Sin is more than that. The Bible says right here um, in James chapter number four, verse number 17, he says, therefore, to him who knows to do good, to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is what? Sin. So if God asks you to do something that you don't do, it is sin. Come on, work with me. It is. That's right. Somebody didn't want to own that this morning. <laughs> it's sin. When we know to do good and we don't do it, the Bible says, not Pastor Glover, says it is sin. Sin is one of the things that keeps us from the dominion of God. That keeps us from attaching ourselves, connecting ourselves to what it is that God wants for our life. The second thing that keeps us is unbelief. 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 Oh, there's a great scripture. We're going to dig into it a little bit further in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number six. It, it, we're going to dig into it further. But unbelief, unbelief is one of those things that keeps you because without faith, the Bible says it's impossible. I had to get there now. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we're going to break it down in a minute here. But that's what it says. So I can't even please God. I can't even be on the same page, the, page, the same sheet music with God if I don't have faith. It's like two different people playing. Both of them are playing the piano at the same time and they're playing two different songs. And you're trying to listen to it and it sounds terrible. Now, both of them individually sound amazing, but because they're playing something different at the same time, you can't decipher if you know what's being played. It doesn't sound good. It, it, it just it's not sinking. It's, I mean, you just you're in a whole different place. You can't even get into the worship because you're like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> That's what it's like when we don't have faith. God is like, listen, you're on a whole different song that I'm on. You got to get on the same page with me if you want to walk in this dominion that I have for you. This dominion that comes by the way of the kingdom of God. And then the third one is it's the lack of knowledge. That's the other one. There's some people that just don't know. Like they just don't they don't know how good God is like for real. Like there's people that have zero idea how good God is. And so because of that lack of knowledge, the Bible says in Hosea chapter four, verse six, he says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from uh, being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I have also forgotten your children. 
So the lack of knowledge is beneficial, or it's not beneficial. The lack of knowledge is detrimental, excuse me, to us connecting to the kingdom of God. So let's walk in this faith one for a second. In Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 6, he says, without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible. You don't even have a chance to be able to please God, to be positioned effectively, to do the things that God has called you to do without faith. Faith is the substance of things of hope for, which it says in 11 verse 1, and the, and the evidence of things not seen. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to know God. You can't even really know God without faith because there's nothing that's attaching you to the knowledge by which you're trying to obtain. There are many that know the Bible better than, than I might know it, but still don't know God because they know the information that has been written in the Bible, but they don't really know who God is. They've read it in a way to try to diminish what it says versus to try to attach and establish what it says for them in their own personal lives. Without faith, it's impossible to even understand and follow God's instructions. Why would you follow the instructions of a God that you don't know and that you have no faith in? So therefore, we cannot walk in the fullness of who God's called us to be because we don't know God. And we say, well, why are these people acting so crazy? They don't know God. It's very simple. They don't have any relationship. There's no attachment, no connection to God. Therefore, they think that the actions are justified on what they do and how they do it. They're OK with doing it because they've got no one that they're answering to outside of themselves. But when you are a child of the most high God, God is our lead and guide and directs us to where he wants us to go. And so then we get down to the scripture says, for he who comes to God, that's what it says. He says, but without faith, it's impossible to believe in God for he who comes to God. Now, this is very interesting and important. That means God says that in order for us to get to this place where he starts to become something to us, we've got to make a move towards him. We've got to make a move. That's why God allows crazy to happen. So we get into a position where we're like, man, can't nobody help me with this? Do we say, God? We don't even know God, but we say, God. God's like, oh, he made a move. He made a move. Because he who comes to God, who makes a move towards God, who makes a, a inference to come towards God, he says in the word of God here, he says, he who comes to God must believe. So first, I'm making this move to come to God. I'm making this relationship. I'm starting this movement based on my circumstances and situations will determine the effort that I take to move towards God. If it's a little something going on, maybe I make a small move. If it's something that's really big that's going on, I mean, you go to the doctor and the doctor say you got cancer and you only got six months to live. I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, people are making big moves towards God. Because they are afraid. They are scared of dying. And so therefore, they know that there's nothing that no one can do and no amount of money they have that can save them from the situation that they're in. And so now they make a massive move towards God. God says you don't have to wait for the, the doctor to tell you you got cancer to make a massive move. You can make that move today founded on your faith. He said who comes to God must first believe that he is. Who is God? You must believe that he is. You, I must believe that he is the almighty. He's the all powerful. He's the all sufficient. I must believe that he is. And then he says, and you must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So first I got to believe in who God is. And then I got to believe in God's capabilities. The two things that you must believe in. If you cannot believe in who God is, he is the almighty, the all powerful, the all sufficient, the all knowing God. I got to first believe that. Then after that, now I believe in who he is. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. My pursuit after Christ is not in vain. It's not in vain. He is a rewarder. How does God reward us in any way that he wants to reward us with peace, with love, with joy, with happiness, with gentleness, with meekness, with long suffering? I mean, he give you whatever it is that you need because he is God. And so now he showers down on us grace and mercies and all the other things that we might need just because we're believing in who God is and we're believing that he's a rewarder. And matter of fact, no matter how crazy my situation is, I always keep God first. Matter of fact, no matter how good my situation is. 
I keep God first. Because, see, we likely sometimes when things change and it's not crazy anymore, that's when we want to put God to the side. That's when we're like, okay, God, you know, we're going to put you off to the side. I got everything I need now. I got the new job. I got the new house. I got the car paid off, and now I'm straight. That's when we start missing services. Yeah, that, that's what that happens. And then we say, oh, I don't need God as much as I used to need God, and so I'm out a little bit. You know, I don't need him as much. You know, I'm kind of doing my thing now because I'm just, you know, kind of doing my thing. But God says, no, I want you to seek and pursue after him all the time. So, therefore, now you can go where the Bible says from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. That's why I love the song where it says every round goes higher and higher and higher, right? That's what the way God wants with our lives, that as we get older, life becomes better and better and better and better because my relationship with God becomes closer and closer and closer and closer. That's what God desires from us. He doesn't want us to have the roller coaster faith. You know, when we up and we, like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then we go down, like, oh my God, what just happened? And then we up again and like, oh, this is amazing again. And then we're down, like, what happened to that happen? Right? No, He wants us to continue to go up. Like, wow, this is high, but I know God wants me to go higher. Oh, wow, this is really high, but I know God wants me to go higher because the higher that I can go now, when I go back down to help somebody else up, I can be the example of how what's possible in their life. And that's why God connects us and puts us together. So not only do I believe in who he is, but I also believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So now we get back. Now we get back to Matthew chapter number 16. Now that we've got that as the baseline of what God's looking to do in our lives, we get to Matthew chapter number 16. And I love this passage of scripture. I absolutely love it. And I'm going to tell you exactly why I love it here in a second, because this passage of scripture really lays down the train tracks to the place where God is calling for us to go. I mean, if God has got you on a path, I mean, God is laying train tracks down in front of you because if you run out of track, (laughs) you can no longer keep going. And so what this scripture does, it allows you to understand the road by which God has called for you to travel. He's giving us directions and instructions and saying, listen, I got train tracks out there. Stop trying to make your own tracks. I've got tracks. Just ride the ones that I put down. These are good tracks. Jesus rode these tracks. So if Jesus rode these tracks, then you ride them. So he says in Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? In the scripture, in verse number 14, it says, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. Now, I love how Jesus was setting them up. He says, who do they say that I am? So they said, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Now, the answer that they gave was true. They didn't really understand who Jesus was. Let me tell you why. Because they really didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They only had a relationship with what Jesus did. They only had a relationship to the miracles. They only had a relationship to the signs and the wonders. They only had a relationship to all the miracles and the things that he did and the things that he said, but they really didn't know who he really was. Matter of fact, when Jesus, I can't remember if it was the 4,000 or the 5,000 people when he did the Two fish and five loaves. It was one of the two. After the fact, he said, you brought a vipers. You come just to get miracles. (laughs) Like you're just here 
to just rack up and collect on the miracles that I'm capable of doing. Like he downplayed and chastised the people because they was there just to get miracles, but not really understand who he is so they could understand who he's called them to be. See, Jesus wanted more for them, for them just to see him and just be enamored by the actions and the activities that he had. He wanted them to know him in a way to be able to pull on the essence and the spirit and the power that was in him so that now, my children, you can live the way that I live. That's what he wanted for them. It was more than just you see all the miracles that I do. Follow me around. Bring me more people that need to be healed. No, I need you to catch on to this faith that it, that initiates the healing so that therefore when you're somewhere where I'm not, you've got the capability of laying hands and healing somebody. Are you with me, somebody? The healing is not for the people that have pastor in front of their name, bishop in front of their name, evangelist in front of their name, and whatever other thing you want to put in front of their name on the back of the name or in the behind the name. It don't matter. God's given that capability and that power to each of us. We just haven't believed that we have that power. So when we need that, we call the pastor first and say, pastor, I need you to pray for me. And I'm going to say, have you prayed for yourself? Because the power of God that's in you can heal you. I'm just a confirmation of that power to now release you from that thought process that you can't do what God said that you can do. You ain't got to call me. Somebody's sick, Pastor. I need you to come and pray for them. You pray. You there. I'm in New York. <laughs> How am I going to pray? I don't get back till Friday. <laughs> you pray. And let the power of God work through you. Your power is not dependent upon it coming through me, but coming through God. See, I'm here just to help set you up for success based on your personal connection with the king. That's what God wants for our life. So he says to the disciples, hey, who do people say? Who do they say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. See, it's hard to know who somebody really is without a relationship with them. So people will take the little that they know about you. You know how people do. They'll take the little that they know about you, and they will make an assumption about who you are based on what they know. We do the same thing, the people right now. We do it. I mean, we see somebody on TV, and we know exactly who they are, how they are. Like you see, a fam let me just think about like LeBron James. You see LeBron James on TV, and we got an idea. You got an opinion of who he is based on what you've seen and what you know. You don't really know LeBron. You don't really have no relationship with him. Like you've seen him, and you've seen him do the things that he has done. And now you make a decision about who he is just based on what you see. But if you see something that you shouldn't see or you see something that you don't like, what you should do is pray for him instead of talk about him. Because that's why we're here. And so now we are thinking we know who someone is because we have little knowledge about them. People know what kind of job you do. And they say, oh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's Terrence. You know, he's the uh, vice president for T-Mobile. And so now they start to relate and attach themselves to you based on what you do. So now what you do becomes who you are to a lot of people. Like you are not really, you know, a child of God. You're not really blessed and highly favored by the most high. You're not really standing on top of the devil on your feet. You're really just the VP that works at T-Mobile because that's all they know about you. And so therefore, that's what they see in you. But see, you don't really know me until you have a relationship with me. You, don't, you, can't, even, you can't even say you know me until at least we just sat down and ate together. I mean, we at least have to have a meal <clears throat> Excuse me, before you can say you really know me. But we make these thought processes about who people are based on the limited knowledge that we have of them. So that's why Jesus wanted them to first articulate what do other people say about me, because he wanted them to know that they are not correct in their estimation. And so now, 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 so first of all, don't let people paint a picture of who you are because you will start believing it. You start going on social media and start, you put some posts out there and people start saying, oh, why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? Or you this or you that? And so now you're starting to believe what other people say instead of believing in what God says. So you got to be very careful. You got to be very careful not to believe in what other people have said about you. You got to be very careful to believe only in what God has said about you. Sometimes, can I say it like this? Oh, sometimes even your parents really don't know who you are. 
Oh, man, that's tough, but that's right. It's right, it's right, it's right. They really don't know who you are. They really don't know what's on the inside of you. They really don't know what God is doing in you. Can I use an example? I love my father. Dad, you know I love you, right? I love my father. My father is awesome. He's an awesome man of God. I love him. I love him. He's the best thing since sliced bread. I remember when I got, uh, I was coming out the military. I was coming out the military and I started this job. I started the job. It was Alltel Wireless. I got a job. I was working at, uh, I was working at Walmart selling uh, cell phones. That's where it started for me. I was coming out the military. I applied for like 30, 40 different jobs. I got no jobs. I got one job called me literally two weeks before I was getting out of the military. They called me and they said, hey, we want you to come in uh, for an interview. I went in for the job for the interview and the lady didn't even ask me any questions. She said, oh, you'll be so great for this job. I think you'll do so well, blah, 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 blah. blah. When can you start? I'm like, okay, this is cool. I said, I'll start on this day. She said, okay, no problem. We'll have you start. So I start the job. And so I get the job. I'm all excited because I, I knew God called me to stay in Kansas for a little while. And so I call my parents and I'm talking to them and talking to my mom, dad, you know, I just got this new job, everything. I'm going to stay out here and do this. And then uh, my dad said, well, how long is that job going to last? He said, how long that job going to last? You know, he said, how, how many, how many phones you think you're going to be able to sell? You think everybody going to want a phone? Now, this is back in 2002 when everybody didn't even have a phone, right? It, before it is like it is today and right now. But see, sometimes they don't know what God's got in store for you. And so now I went from working in Walmart part-time in Salina, Kansas, to running the East Coast as a VP. Because, see, people don't know what God's got in store for you sometimes. And so sometimes you got to go against even what your parents are saying to go out there and do the thing which you know God has called you to do. Now, I'm not talking about you disobey your parents and go do what you think you should be doing. Now, that's a whole different ball game. You better get some prayer in and get some direction in before you just start hauling off there and say, well, I'm going to do my own thing. Pastor told me that don't listen to nobody. Do what I want to do. No, that's not what pastor said. I'm saying you got to listen to the voice of the Lord and God will lead you to where he's called you to be. Amen. I just need to tighten that one up. So now you understand that it's about this relationship that you have, that people don't let people paint a picture of you. Matter of fact, I was preaching this. Uh, unfortunately, we had this funeral that we went to on Friday. My uncle had passed away and I was doing the eulogy for his funeral on Friday. And God had gave me this uh, in the midst of the message. I didn't even write it in my notes, but I feel like it's important now as well that even the woman with the issue of blood, we don't even know her name. We only know her by her issue. That's how they referenced her. That's how they talked about her. That's how they acknowledged her. They didn't even give her her own name. They only acknowledged her by the situation that she was going through. People will paint a picture of you by the situation that you're going through, and they will never give you an opportunity. That's why the power of God is so important, because God has got to override the things that are going on around you and do supernatural things in your life where others will have to pay attention and change your name. So they will no longer see you the way that you used to be, but they'll see you for who you are and for what God is doing in your life right now. That's the beautiful thing about God. Because we've all gone through situations and difficulty. We all got closets that got skeletons in them. All of us. But that's not who I am. Saul, Saul of Tarsus was killing Christians before God said, listen, I'm good. This, everybody saw him as a persecutor of the Christians. God saw him as two-thirds of the New Testament. That's what God saw. And so because of what God saw, God pushed him into a place where no one else was willing to give him a chance. Even when God went to Ananias, he said, Ananias, I need you to go heal him from his blindness. Ananias said, hold on, God, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you know what this man is here to do? <laughs> like, this man is here to take folks like us and kill us and throw us in jail. God said, no, no, no. See, you only see him for what he's done based on history. God see him. I, listen, I got something in store for him. Two-thirds of the New Testament came from a murderer. So God asked them, who do men say that I am? He said, listen, this is all the people that we think you are. Now let's go to verse number 15. Verse number 15. He says, then he says to them, but who do you say I am? So we've heard about what other people are saying. Now there should be a different response here. Why? Because these folks been with him. 
There should be a different response because these jokers have been with him. They've been connected. They've been attached to Jesus. So therefore, guess what Simon Peter, it says here, answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's who he calls him. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. The relationship that the disciples had with Jesus should lead them, should lead them to a different answer, which it did. Now, you don't find out who you are from the highlights of somebody's life. You find out who they are based on the depth of your relationship. See, we didn't been to, we we didn't ate bread together. We didn't been we didn't went to meals together. We didn't went to the wedding together. I didn't seen you heal people. I didn't seen you deliver people. You didn't minister to us multiple times, over and over and over again. You've corrected us. You've pushed us and you've uh you know pushed us to the side sometimes. You told us that we need to pray sometimes. You told us about our faith. You have increased us. You've grown in us. And so now this connection and this attachment to who Jesus is, Simon Peter comes out and he speaks this answer. So eloquently, he says, listen, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Now you got to understand that you're not just who you are based on what you've done, but you are who you are based on the expectations that God has in you. And now God can shift in you and he can create you and he can position you to do everything that he's called you to do. So Peter responds in confidence based on the relationship that he has with Jesus and the experiences that he has with Jesus. And so now what experiences are those? Well, he saw the blind man heal. He saw the mute man speak. He saw the demon possessed be free. He saw the lepers cleanse, the storm call. He saw them teach on the kingdom of God. And guess what? Peter walked on water with him. Now, listen, you can't get much, you can't get much more miracle than that. I mean, out of all the miracles that are out there, are you with me? Like you don't get much more miracle than that. Peter walks on water with Jesus. That's where he's answering this question from. He's not answering this question based on his own natural thought of, yeah, he's kind of like this guy. No, this man is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. Do you know what he's done in my life? Do you know what he's done in your life? And when you start to acknowledge the good things that God has done in your life and you acknowledge him as the Christ that nobody could have done it if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't even know where I would be. That's where you're answering your question from. So he says, I am Peter. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, when we get to number verse number 17 and 18, and this is where we get, we took all of that time to get to right here about this kingdom piece. And so he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. That means I cannot establish this confidence about Jesus being the Christ unless I have a relationship with the father. My relationship with the father is only established with with the faith that I must have in the Father. So that means without the faith, I can never have the relationship that never leads me to the conclusion about who Jesus really is in my life. So now I don't do things according to what God has said because I really don't have faith in him. I might say I have faith in him, but I really don't have faith in him. I really don't. Because if I really had faith in him, it would be based on an establishment of faith to God and who he is that pushes me to do the things in which he's called for me to do. So he comes to him and says, listen, I just want to let you know. He says, Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, uh, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this revealed. Reveal is actually the root word of the word revelation. That's what revelation really means. It means to reveal the root word of reveal and revelation. The very beginning, I mean, not, not the root word, but the prefix of it is re, which re means again. So he again gave this back to them and said, listen, I'm giving you this again. How many times has God given you something over and 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 over again? You're like, God, why do you keep giving that to me? Because I need you to see this again. So he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then he goes on to say, he says now that it's this father. It's the relationship that Peter has with Jesus is the relationship of this father. Why? Because Jesus is the father. Jesus is the father. 
So it's the relationship with the father that reveals it to him because of his relationship with Jesus. That's why Jesus said no man can go to the father except through him. So if I have a relationship with Jesus, then I have a relationship with the father. And if I have a relationship with the father, then the father will reveal some things to me. He will tell me some things that no one else can tell me. He will show me some things that no one else can show me. He'll say, nope, you need to go right. And you're like, why am I going right? Like literally everyone else is going left. You want me to go right? Yes, I got something for you going right. See, you want to go left because everybody else is going there. I want you to go right because I got something for you to go right. And so then you go right. You get the blessing and the reward because of your obedience in faith. I tell people all the time when I got my last promotion that I got, the, the boss, he, the, my boss's boss called me. It, it, actually, at the time, he was my boss's boss's boss at the time. But my boss's boss now, he calls me. He gets me on the phone with my boss at the time. And he says, listen, we're going to promote you to VP. And he says, you know, we're going to do it. He says, I probably shouldn't even do this. That's what he says first. I probably shouldn't do this. I'm like thinking, well, thank you for the vote of confidence. <laughs> I probably shouldn't do this. He says, because normally when you're promoting someone to VP, you've had multiple director roles in the field and at HQ, multiple different cities, things of that nature, uh, before you promote somebody, you know, to see what they can do and make sure that they're efficient with all these different things. He says, but I'm doing it because there's something different about you because you've got something that no other VP on my team has and we need that on the team so it wasn't because I was going along to getting along that led me to the blessing that God had for me it was because of my difference in me willing to go outside of what everybody else was doing that led me to the place that God wanted me to be if I just act like everybody else, if I just did what everybody else did, there'd be no difference between me and them. But the difference that I had, the deep down that everybody knew there was something a little strange about him. He just connects a little different. That's what I need. That's what I need. You know, my boss is boss. He don't believe in Christ. And so I said he put me on the team because God was like, listen, I need somebody that love the Lord on the team. So God will set you up in your difference. He says, listen, I just want to let you know that this is flesh and blood is not giving you this. It's the father that art in heaven. So Peter says, you are the you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ means anointed one, savior of the world. And then Jesus says this. This is what's interesting about what Jesus says here. He says, um, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm way behind. I need to get back to where I need to be. So he says, listen, you are. He says, blessed bar Jonah, the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Verse 18, that's where I want to be. Verse 18, he says this, and I say to you that you are Peter. Now, man, I'm telling you, I read the scripture five million times. But this time, I recognized in this scripture that the very scripture before this, he calls Peter Simon bar Jonah. He said, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Then he comes back in verse 18. He says, I say to you that you are who? Peter. Now, he was Peter before that too. But for some reason, he specifically called him Simon Bar-Jonah in, in, in verse number 17. And then we get to verse number 18. He calls him Peter. Now, the significance of this is that the word Peter, and you all know this, the word Peter means rock. That's what the word means. And so some people feel like that when Jesus was speaking this, that he was actually saying that on Peter, on Peter is the basis by which this next statement that he's about to make is going to happen. Because he says, and I also say to you that Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But he was not talking about Peter as an individual. He was only making a reference of Peter because his name was the rock but the bible is clear that it's jesus who is the chief cornerstone that everything else is built on and we all know that it was jesus that went into hell and took the keys from satan so therefore jesus was using this 
to tie Peter's name to this foundational thought process that we could establish ourselves with, to understand a rock and a rock being strong and a rock being foundation. And so he's saying, Peter, on the statement that you made about me is the foundation by which this thing shall come to pass. That's where it's coming from. He says, Peter, you are the rock. He says, listen, he says, uh, I say unto you, you are Peter. And on this rock, this rock is the statement by which he proclaimed in verse 17 that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so he says, on this word and on this rock, this statement that you made, the statement that you made, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it that's the that's the foundation the foundation is that he is the christ the son of the living god the relationship established with him and so now he comes down in verse number 19 and he says and i will give you the keys i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's interesting that he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. He doesn't say, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. Now, let's walk through the significance of that one word and the shifting of that word. See, if I get the keys to the kingdom... And that means I have something that I have physical access to get into. I get, I have a key and unlock something. I go in and I take access to whatever it is that is behind the door that I have a key to have access to. Now, the kingdom is God's. But he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. I believe the keys of the kingdom are the principles by which the kingdom works. I'll give you the principles. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And why do I feel like that that's the case? Why do I feel like that God is not talking about the unlocking of a door and us going in and grabbing something and then saying, oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. No, it's the keys of the kingdom. It's the principles behind how something works. You know, it's like the principles of gravity. The principles of gravity. If you go into a 10-story building, and for some strange reason, you make a decision to step out of that building. Gravity, the principle of gravity, will pull you to the earth. And you will probably die. It don't matter if you're black. You'll probably die. It don't matter if you're white, you will probably die. It don't matter if you're Muslim. It don't matter if you're a Christian. The same thing is happening to all of us because it is a principle that governs the earth. God says, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. And the kingdom has different principles than the earth kingdom. So he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom so you can have the capability of doing some things. So now he says, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm giving you the supernatural authority over things that you can only get through the kingdom of God and the principles by which govern the kingdom of God. So that's why I get excited about the kingdom of God, because the kingdom comes with some stuff. It's kind of like when you feed a man a fish, he eat for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he eat for a lifetime. 
God is saying, I want to give you the principles of the kingdom so you know how the kingdom of God works in your life. So when you get ready to bind some stuff up because the enemy is coming at you, he's attacking you. God says you'll be able to look at some stuff and be like, I bind this thing right now in the name of Jesus. I hold it hostage and it will not impact or affect my life in any way. Why? Because I am a child of the most high God. I am standing on top with the devil under my feet. I got no sad stories to tell. My Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against me in judgment I shall condemn. I am the Lord's redeemed. This will be successful for me. I shall be the, the best of what God's called me to be. I'm of a royal priesthood. I'm a peculiar person. That's what my Bible says about me. He says, I walk by faith and not by sight. So even when the enemy comes at me like a Russian mighty flood, the Bible says I will raise up a standard against him. Man, I get, I, get, I get excited when you start saying what God has said. You get excited because you start to feel empowered. You know, you start smelling yourself. That's what my grandmama used to say. She said, boy, stop smelling yourself, thinking that you all that in a bag of chips. But that's how you get when you start saying the things of God because you start feeling supernatural. You start to feel like nothing can stop you. Nothing can hold me back. Even when my foes come at me from the left and from the right, my God shall supply all my need. When you read the scripture, he says, my God will supply all my need. He does even put an S on the end of the statement that's written in your Bible. Why? Because once you get God, you don't need nothing else. He, my God will supply all my need, singular, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Because once I get God, I don't need nothing else. I got everything I need. And so God says, listen, I'm giving you the kingdom so I can establish these principles in your life. In your life, what principles? Well, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There are things that are for you that have been tied up, that the enemy has been holding hostage, and God is waiting for you to believe in order to receive it. And so you trying to get it every kind of way except the way God called you to get it. And it's still locked up. And God's saying as soon as you start believing, 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 then the, it will open and it will be loosed. And now you will receive it and the manifestation of it will happen in your life just because of who God is in your life. That's what God wants to do for you. He wants you to be empowered. He wants you to walk with victory. He wants you to walk with authority. It doesn't matter what might happen tomorrow. It doesn't matter what's going to happen the next day. We're all going to go through valleys. We're all going to go through mountains. We're all going to have things that we got to do that's uncomfortable to us. That doesn't mean God's not with us. That just means God has given us the power and the ability to override wherever it is that we are at. So if God puts a mountain in your way, I'm talking about Mount Everest in your way, just get your pickaxe out and climb that mountain. If he put it there or he allowed it to be there, he's given you everything you need to override it. It don't matter how cold it is. It doesn't matter that you ain't got no snowsuit on. It doesn't matter that you might ain't have no shoes on your feet. If you serve a God that the Bible says is capable of doing the supernatural, then start believing him for the supernatural. Start believing him for the supernatural. Man, you got to just take the limits off of what God's capable of doing in your life and believe him for the supernatural. My God said, my God said, my God said, I go to the doctor, they say something. My God said, I know what you're saying, but my God said, now you go to the job, they say they laying you off. It don't matter if you're laying me off. My God said, he shall supply all my need. And then you go out there and get a job that's better for you anyway, paying you twice as much as you was getting paid before, simply because they laid you off. And you was boo-hooing about it. God was like, finally, he left that joker. Now I can give him what he really deserves. Oh my God. But we want to hold on to the comfortable. And God's asking us to act out in the supernatural. So the kingdom of God, the keys of the kingdom are the principles by which the kingdom works. This is how the kingdom works. The kingdom don't have no seconds. I'm first. I got the best of what God wants for me. I refuse to settle and be satisfied with something that's secondary when God says it's mine. And I'm not talking about being irresponsible either, because you can't go to the mall every day, spend every last dime, and then talk about, God, I need a new car. I mean, you can't be in debt with just tons and tons of hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, all kinds of stuff. You know, the furniture is on loan. I mean, the TV is on loan. The car is on loan. The house is on loan. The clothes are on loan. The tires on the car are on loan. I mean, everything's on loan. 
And then when Christmas time comes around, you put half of Christmas on loan. Now you go on vacation. You use your credit card on vacation. And so now you take your vacation back home with you because you haven't paid for it yet. So all the dollars and cents you need. And then we like, God, why am I going through what I'm going? Wisdom. I was listening to somebody earlier. I'm, I'm done. I'm just about done. I was listening to somebody uh, earlier this, this week. Uh, actually, it was last week. And um, uh, I can't remember who it was, but he was speaking. Uh, gosh, I, whoever it was, he was speaking. He said, he said, if you took all the money, if you took all the money from everybody and you dished it out evenly to every single person on the earth, that 90% of the money would go right back into the same hands of the people that had it previously. Now, why is that the case? Because those folks found out how to do something. They weren't looking for the money. They found out how to reproduce and how to cultivate and how to create sources of income that would allow them to get to the places that they are. And we're just sitting back praying that God give it to us without giving us the principles or the keys of success that are necessary in order to be that which God's calls to be. We want the blessing, but we don't want the grind. We want the favor, but we don't want to put in the work. We don't want the education. And here's the thing. The world is constantly changing. So what you knew from yesterday won't help you get to where you need to be tomorrow. And so God will push you out of the place of yesterday because he already knows what's coming tomorrow. And we get stuck. Well, I can't believe God didn't bless me. I've been praying for the last two years and I still ain't received nothing. Now, here's the deal. Now, if you ain't got what God says is yours, it's only one of two people's fault. It's either your fault or God's fault. I mean, that's, the, that's it's either his fault or it's your fault. Now, last time I checked, I only got a watch on. But the last time I checked, God ain't never made a mistake. I'm talking about the man in the mirror. Oh, yeah. I'm asking him to change his ways. There's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. But if you don't want to change and you want to be bound, you can be. God is not forcing you to go where he's asked you to go. He's not forcing you. He gave you the power to choose. Whatever you bound on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God wants to give you the power to bind and loose things in your life so that you will receive everything that God has for you. The kingdom, the kingdom, this established government that comes from the heavenly places to give you the power to do what it is you need to do. I want you to make sure you come back next week because... Next week is when we talk about the establishment of the kingdom and how God runs the kingdom on earth. So you're not going to want to miss it. God has a process that he put in place on how he runs the kingdom on earth. And I'm going to open the windows to that thing and I'm going to show you the light that God shines on the word because he says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. And so that's why we teach in this, because we want you to be empowered and we want you to be victorious. Every round goes higher and higher. And when you come and you sit down this time next year, I want you to be able to look at somebody and be like, look at what 
the Lord has done. And it is marvelous in our sight. Come on, everybody standing. Everybody standing. The kingdom of God, 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 the kingdom of God. God wants you to have a relationship because he wants you to be connected and attached. He wants you to be empowered. He wants you to have authority. He wants you to have victory. Victory is always in Christ Jesus. It's always in Christ Jesus. Paul changed who he was. He was he was murdering Christians, shifted, changed left out and started preaching the word of God to all the churches in the land. He said, I'm not sending you to the Israel, the Israelites. I'm sending you to everybody else that don't know who I am. I'm sending you to the Corinthians. I'm sending you to the Ephesians. I'm sending you to the, the church of Philippi. I'm sending you all these different places to preach and teach. That what I'm telling you to preach and teach. That's what he told him to do. He was empowered to do it. Everyone saw him as murderer. Everyone saw him as the person put in persecuting Christians. God saw him as someone that he was going to use. And that's how God sees you. That's how God sees you. Don't limit you. Well, pastor, this is the way that I was raised. This is who I am. This is the, this is the way I just kind of do things. Who told you that's how you do things? You are a child of God. You have the capacity to do whatever it is that God's called you to do. You've got power and you've got strength. You've got might. You are amazing. I feel like somebody needs to hear that this morning. You are amazing. You say, I can't change. I can't change. Who told you you can't change? Who told you? Who have you been listening to? Who have you believing in? You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. Grandma, you are, you're amazing. I mean, you're amazing. I can just feel the essence of God on you. You're just amazing. You just have so much love for your family. You have so much love for other people. You're just amazing. You are awesome. You still got it. Don't let nobody tell you different. You're still a blessing to so many people that they might not even come and tell you, but you are. You're a blessing to all those people that you're connecting with and talking to and saying stuff to. And sometimes they don't even try to pay you any attention and you just keep on keeping on because you are a blessing. And you are changing the lives of the people that are around you. Your family is blessed. They are blessed because of you. They are blessed. God will take care of them. He will protect them. He will keep them. He will lead them and guide them. They say might be out there doing some things like now. You're like, oh, man, what are they doing? God's got it. Just keep on praying. It was a prayer, Grandma, that saved me. You are awesome. Miss Lissette, you are awesome. You are fantastic. Don't, don't even con be concerned about the lies people try to say about you and about who you are, the things that have happened to you. It don't even matter. God has a future for you that's bigger than you can even ask or think according to the power that works on the inside of you. The power is in you. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. And people will look back. You'll even look back and say, I can't even believe what God was able to do. That's how he's going to work. He's stirring everything up right now. He got all kinds of things. It's just like a big old pot of gumbo. He's throwing all kinds of things in the pot. He's just stirring it all up. And you're like, why is all this stuff getting stirred up? That's because he got something awesome that's going to come on the other end of it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And I can't wait to see what God does. I can't wait. Come on, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for each and every one that's here. God, we pray for the ones that don't even, can't even see, God, what you're about to do. God, we thank you for the ones that have never tapped into the kingdom of God, never really understood the kingdom of God, never really walked in the power and the authority that you've given to them. God, we pray that right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you bless them to see, you bless them to understand, you bless them to walk effectively, to do the things which you have called for them to do. 
God, we know it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by your spirit, saith the Lord. God, we thank you for these lessons that show us and uh, allow us to recognize the potential that we have in our lives to believe, because without faith, it's impossible to please you. Without faith, we cannot overcome. Without faith, we can't even know you. Without faith, we can't do anything that you've asked for us to do. But God, with faith, there is nothing that becomes impossible for us. And so God, we bless your holy name that we walk in obedience, we walk with the power, and we walk with the authority of God, believing those things as if they weren't already were. And God, we thank you, Lord, that it's already done. Let us see the manifestation of our faith come right now in the name of Jesus, that you will get the glory, that you will get the honor, and that you will get the praise for your name's sake. We call these things and believe these things in the power and in the authority and in the belief and the faith of you, Christ Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this moment, and we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. We thank you and we praise you, God. Amen.